All right, thank you so much. Who here is building an MVP? Show of hands. You found the right talk. Awesome. Um, at least a few of you. Let me preempt my um, talk with, if the clicker works, let me preempt my talk with um, the one thing I want you to take away with, it, which is that MVP is not one thing. Um, it might have been in 2011 one thing. Um, today, I think you need to think about it a bit differently. You think, need to think about it as more of a journey um, or a process. Um, I like the word journey, uh, journey better. Um, and to understand this, like, let's take an example of Linear and let's take our early journey uh, from our idea to essentially launching publicly um, and getting to you know, product market fit. If you don't know what Linear is, um, Linear is a uh, way of building software. Um, it's a software project management tool. It um, was founded four years ago uh, by, uh, by, by me and two of my uh, founders, uh, Joy and Kari. Um, and uh, we're pretty successful in, in sort of the, uh, the, the startup scene. I think 50% of YC companies in the last batch, for example, were using us, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I am Thomas, I'm the co-founder um, and CTO of Linear. Uh, prior to that, I was um, at Uber, um, where I spent you know, quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to scale mobile engineering. And um, I have to you know, give a word of caution, there's survivorship, uh, survivorship bias ahead. Um, we have you know, been so lucky that you know, we've become you know, somewhat successful at least. Uh, and um, everything that I'm going to tell you is not sort of ground truth. Um, and you should you know, think hard and talk with other people who have not made it. Like we're one in 10 um, who've sort of you know, gone over, um, uh, you know, ha have been able to uh, continue um, uh, working, uh, working as a startup. So anything that you know, I tell you, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt and also talk with people. Um, other people in order to sort of figure out what you want from, from an MVP. So to get back to the definition that Eric Ries um, in 2011 um, had on MVP, the minimum viable product is that version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. Um, so essentially what he's saying is um, if you have an idea that you don't know um, if it's going to succeed in the marketplace, you should try to very quickly um, build something, whatever that is, to validate that idea. And by building something, it might be that you build um, a very quick prototype or a very quick pro, uh, product uh, that you set out to your users. It might be something totally different as well. It might be a pamphlet um, that you use to sort of describe your idea. It might be a commitment from, from somebody you know, to give you money or purchase your product when it's, when it's done. You might be selling slideware, whatever that is. My point today is that you know, this was defined 2011, um, which is you know, quite a bit of time, if you think about sort of internet, internet time, um, to give you a bit of sense you know, what that essentially, you know, uh, or what the time looked like. Uh, the presentation that Eric gave where he introduced MVP um, was done as a flash presentation, so you can no longer look at it. Um, so, why do you need to think about MVP more of as a journey and not this sort of quick hack to validate your idea? Um, it, it worked back in the day when, um, when you sort of you know, had something that, that, that needed validation, where you didn't know whether there was a marketplace for your idea. If you take, for example, Airbnb and, um, well, not really Uber, but Simride, for example, like those were ideas um, that might have gone totally wrong and you might not have a product. Um, you know, in the case of Airbnb, you know, who started in 2009, so just you know, two, um, two years after, uh, two years after uh, Eric came out with his MVP um, notion, um, they wanted to figure out whether people would be comfortable spending the night at, at a stranger's home, um, and, and vice versa as well. And it is not clear cut. Um, today it's obvious that it worked, but back in the day when you when nobody had tried out that idea, it wasn't clear whether um, it would succeed. So what essentially they did, they built um, a very quick MVP um, at a conference in, um, in San Francisco and tried to invite people to their home to sleep on an air mattress. Um, and they got three people paying um, to sleep at their home. So that was sort of their validation for that idea. And they, they set out and ventured forth. Uh, same as Simride, um, 
Zimride, which later became Lyft, um, had this idea, well, you know, if people are commuting to work, why not just tag along and have some you know, strangers you know, get in the car with them to drive to the same location? Again, the same kind of idea, like that wasn't readily available. Nobody had done it before, so it wasn't clear whether people would be comfortable just jumping in a stranger's, stranger's car. Um, today, if you, if you look at companies that have been founded, for example, in the past you know, eight years, um, you know, companies like Zoom, Slack, um, TikTok, Snowflake, uh, Robinhood or Getir, um, those, no, uh, those are not novel ideas. Um, those are great companies and great products, but they're not novel. They're not category defining. They took something and just made it better. So for them, um, an MVP wasn't about just you know, figuring out whether the market was there for a new idea. Um, it was trying to figure out something else. Um, and to look at what that something else might mean, um, let's jump over to sort of you know, a regular startup uh, path that startups might take. You start with the idea, um, you build on an MVP, um, you maybe iterate on that MVP, um, and at some point you're ready um, and you figure out that you know, there's something here, there's an inkling of, um, of you know, maybe product market fit, inkling of, of traction. Um, you, your idea might actually be able to fly. And that's usually the point when you start fundraising. Like you've got demonstrable traction, um, and now it's a good time to start with start talking with VCs, get that money in, and effectively everything from there on out is just using that money to refine your product and and, and moving ahead. Um, so let's draw a line um, in between here. Um, you get from idea using that MVP, and you iterate. And at some point, you, you reach, through that iteration, you reach a line where you're comfortable with moving ahead, um, be it you know, fundraising, be it launching publicly. Um, but at least you have an idea of an inkling of, of your product being able to fit into that market. Um, and in the lack of sort of having a term for that, let me try to coin one um, today. Um, Eric has his MVP. Um, I'm trying to coin the financial market promise um, as, uh, as an acronym. Um, FMP. So the, the idea or the, 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 the thing that an MVP does is try to get your idea um, through you know, uh, prototyping, through building out your product um, uh, to the place where you think you have foundational market promise, where you think your company can succeed in the market, where you have users, maybe you have paying users, but at least users who, who, think, um, who you think uh, will, will sort of you know, make your company fly. To um, illustrate our journey um, and to give you sort of concrete examples of what we did in this journey from this idea to this inkling of product market fit, the foundational market promise, um, let's start with the beginning. Um, Linear's idea was that there's a need for um, you know, modern software project management. Um, we talked with a lot of users, like I was at Uber back in the day, uh, Kari, my other co-founder, was at Airbnb, and uh, Jory was at Coinbase. Um, and talking with users, we sort of, you know, figured that you know all the ICs um, that we talked to really didn't like whatever project management tool they were using. Um, like they, they were really pretty harsh in, in their in their feedback, um, and we found that super strange. We we're like, why why is that? Like why why don't people, you know, like whatever um, they have to use daily? And if so, why hasn't anybody built anything better? Um, so we, you know, probably spent six months just, you know, discussing this idea. Um, but we didn't want to do anything about it because, you know, project management is pretty, pretty boring as, as a category. So we didn't want to, want to, want to jump in. Um, and it took us, you know, it took us a while to understand that the mission is not really to build a project management tool. The mission is something bigger. The mission is to help companies be better at building software. Um, and that was a mission that we could get behind. And like now we had a purpose. Like we, we knew that you know this was actually something that um, we we could sink our teeth into for the next ten years. And from that mission, um, you have to think big. Like you have to figure out before you even start building out your MVP, um, you have to figure out like where where do you want to go? Like what is the end goal of of your of your startup? And to us is that it you know we want Linear to be the standard in building any kind of software product. Big vision. Now, how do you use an MVP to you know, get on your journey? Um, there's some validation here, sure. Like We need to figure out whether our idea um, actually, um, actually matters, whether people you know, feel the same as we do, whether we can build something modern and people would want to use it. 
Um, but we have this big vision of project, project management. Like, do we have to build the entire suite um, of you know, tools, all this functionality in order to validate the idea and, and get started with an MVP? Uh, no. What we can do is we, we can scope down. And um, that's what we did. Um, and one of the key realizations that, um, that, that, that at least I had um, when, we, when we started Linear and when, when I look back at the journey was that the key to building a successful MVP is to scope down as much as possible. Again, you're competing against somebody else because your idea is probably not novel. Um, if you have a novel idea, then congrats. Um, you're going to define a category. That's awesome. But the rest of you are probably just not, not just, you're competing against somebody else. Your idea how to compete might be novel, uh, but you're still in the same category, so you have to build something better. You have to build a product that com competes um, with the rest of the industry. So we said, well, if we have to compete with somebody, let's compete with a very, very, very narrow target segment and start that way, which still goes into the direction of building you know, a company that you know, will be the standard of building software um, in the future. So we said, you know, for us to build something like we, we're going to target ICs at very, very small uh, startups. Um, we're going to take startups that have maybe you know, five, um, uh, five people, um, all engineers, or maybe even a designer, throw them in. Um, and that is our target segment. So what can we build for them? Um, and we said, well, we don't need to build project management because they don't need project management. We can start with issue tracking, the atomic unit of what you know, companies need. Um, and that was our idea for our MVP, or our first MVP. We've, we've got many. Um, and by the way, we never call it MVP, we just call it product. And I think that's fine. Um, and we said, you know, we're going to be a fast, modern application um, that has multiplayer capabilities. Awesome. Um, so we set on our way and said, you know, from scoping down um, to prototyping, let's you know, try to build this as quickly as possible. Um, and we built a version for ourselves. Like we had. Um, you know, uh, we had the opportunity to build something for ourselves because we were, were direct users of the product, um, which made things much easier. Um, and um, sorry, I was behind in the slides. There you go. So after we, you know, prototyped something, um, and we thought we had. Uh, something that, you know, might be competitive in that, in that small target segment, but we started showing, um, sorry. Prototyping and augment. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry with the slide. So after scoping down, and we had a prototype that we were, we were happy with. Um, we uh, you know, wanted to show it to a few friends. Um, and uh, I showed it to one, and I explained, like, you know, we've got these three pillars that we build this application for. Like, we want it to be fast, and we want it to be sort of modern with keyboard shortcuts and all that. And we want it to be multiplayer so that you know, everything updates in real time. Um, and my friend came back and said, well, um, you know, whatever I'm using currently is fast enough for me. Um, and secondly, like, I don't really need keyboard shortcuts. Like, why? Um, and, you know, multiplayer, I, I don't really care. Like, I can refresh the page, no, no, no problems. So I was down for, like, you know, a minute. I was like, are we building the right thing? Like, this is our MVP moment. Like, we've built something, we showed it to the first user, and they just shut it down. Um, thankfully, you know, I went ahead um, and you showed it to a few, few others, um, not friends, but you know, just other random people. And you know, I've got my confidence back and said, you know, they, they liked it um, and they were happy, happy using it. And uh, you know, I, I thought we were onto, onto something. So after you know, the prototyping stage, when we were happy with the product itself, we did announce it. Um, and the main reason for you know, the announcement was to start building out um, a, a wait list. Um, and you know, to early validate our idea as well. So you can think the announcement as, as some sort of you know, MVP as well, um, where you sort of post a blog post about it and then see you know, what the kind of reaction um, is. And um, the purpose of the wait, wait list was to sort of start getting um, some traction uh, and getting people in line uh, to try the product, which we'll use later to sort of refine it. Um, and then, you know, after that announcement, after we had, um, you know, uh, uh, gained some 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 waitlist users, uh, we were we were ready to sort of open up for early access. And the whole point and idea of that early access and, and private beta was to utilize uh, utilize our, our waitlist um, to find that foundational market promise. So again, we were we had built something that was super small. 
had almost no functionality. It was a sort of very basic issue tracker. Um, and we had 10,000 users lined up on our wait list. Um, and, and the key realization that, you know, the second key realization that I had when, when, I, when I built Linear was that, you know, the wait list really is the fuel um, that lets you refine your product and launch publicly. So you've got this small MVP, you've got this small prototype, and you've got 10,000 users. Now, literally what you do is you exchange that, you know, wait list for a more refined product. And the way we did it is um, we, we asked specific questions when people signed up to that wait list. Um, we asked things like, you know, size of the company, you know, role at the company. Um, we asked sort of what, what they were currently using or what their VCS was. Um, we only had, you know, a GitHub integration, so we want, want, didn't want to sort of have people who had something else, you know, use our product because they wouldn't get much out of it. Um, and then also, you know, why would you use Linear? Um, and this helped us sort of categorize who we let in first. Like we wanted people that were, um, that probably would be comfortable using Linear uh, for at least some time. Like that were, um, that were, where we resonated or where the, where the um, initial blog post resonated with them, where they wanted something that was fast and something that was multiplayer um, and something that had keyboard shortcuts so that we could get, gain um, some users that we could ask questions from. Like if you invite them first, uh, if, if you want the incorrect users to use your prototype, like they will just churn away and you will learn nothing. Um, so you had to sort of handpick, and that's what we did, did for the first month or so. We just literally handpicked individuals or individual companies from that wait list, invited them to Linear, and then you know, had sessions with them. We, we you know, looked at how they used Linear. Um, we talked with them. We had chats with them. Um, we had you know, Slack channels with them. And we tried to learn as much as possible. Um, and that also gave us sort of direction what to build next. And um, the, 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 when, when we started, like when we didn't hear any, any sort of requests anymore or any, any comments that were new, um, that was sort of a good indication for us that, you know, it's, it's time to expand um, and it's time to invite, you know, more people from the wait list and maybe sort of expand that, that, the target segment as well a bit. So I invited a you know, few larger companies in there, um, saw them churn um, quite quickly, um, tried to reach out and figure out like, you know, wh why that happened. Um, and again, got some ideas on, on you know, what they need um, if you want to go into the tar uh, larger, larger you know, target segments. And we kept on doing that. We kept on iterating on the product, building something out for the users that were there, seeing that they were happy when they had no requests anymore. We tried to invite new users from that wait list. So it, effectively, over the course of a year, we exchanged our wait list for a more refined product. Um, so our wait list looked approximately something like this, like we, we had, you know, 10,000 users at best, I think, on the wait list. And then over time, we just, you know, cut down on that until we got, you know, maybe to half of the entire wait list. And at that point, we were confident enough that we had a great product that had some foundational market promise, FMP, hashtag, um, and that we were able to, you know, give it out to the world and have people just, you know, sign up um, on, on their own. So because, you know, the, the wait list, uh, at least, you know, uh, I think is the most important tool that you can have, um, it, it, you know, we can spend some time figuring out, like, how to create a large wait list. Because for me, this wasn't sort of clear cut um, at all. And um, I made some mistakes, you know, uh, in, in, in my prior work as well. So the, the, the best way to get a big wait list is to get, you know, a huge social following prior to starting up. Um, we were lucky that we had Kari, who had, I don't know, 15,000 um, users on, on X. Um, and that was literally uh, the way that we got our message out there and we got, you know, people signing up on, on our wait list. Um, what I didn't realize, like I had spent five years um, at Uber prior to this, um, and we were working on, on stuff that was, you know, pretty incredible on the mobile side. Um, and uh, I, I should have sort of used that back in the day to sort of really, you know, get some, get some following. Like I could have, you know, posted about, you know, the work that I do at Uber and then try to get a following of myself um, in order to sort of, you know, have a better initial audience. Um, and that's maybe something that you should, you know, should think about if, you, um, if you're working at larger companies or even smaller companies that are doing amazing work. Um, you should use that to just gain a following. It will immensely help um, to get a, a big wait list. Um, I teamed up with Kari, who had a following already, um, which helped us, you know, get the 10,000 users. Um, you, you know, had a good presence as a company on social media, obviously, as well, and build it out in the open. Like, be super open about what you're building. Um, we did that from day one. Like, 
Um, whenever somebody asked us like what we're what we're doing, we were open about open about it. We even you know walked people through our code uh, if they were interested, um, and just you know be a sort of good citizen in, in the startup scene. Um, and you can also get angels that can help you sort of build out um, that initial waitlist. So. When do you know if your product is ready to get out of this MVP stage or MVP journey where you've taken the idea, you've built and iterated over um, your initial product using your wait list? Um, how do you know that you're ready for public launch? Well, the first you know, thing is to talk to your users. Like You will have a gut feeling about whether you're ready or not by just you know, talking with everybody. Um, have slacks with them, have one-on-one -on -one con conversations, um, and figure out like you know how happy they are using the product. Secondly, um, you can do a you know market market product market fit questionnaire, um, like Superhuman. Um, you know I think four years ago uh, made it very popular here. Um, you could ask them you know how um, how sad would they be if they could no longer use um, your product, um, and use that as a way to judge whether you have some built something that people really really want. Um, we did that for, for a while. Um, we had, you know, as part of, you know, a, you know, if you wanted to open a support ticket or wanted to give us feedback, there was this quick questionnaire that you could, you could do. Maybe for us the wrong place, like if you have a problem with the product um, and you then ask the question, how unhappy would you be if you could no longer use the product? Maybe made the, the questions or the answers, you know, a bit um, biased, uh, but at least it gave us a nice trend upwards. Um, and lastly, you can ask your users to pay. Um, that's the ultimate you know, way of figuring out whether your product is ready. If you force people to pay, um, and they do, uh, they're happy with it. But what we did before we forced them to pay, we actually um, told them that they, they can pay if they want to. They don't have to, but you know, we put up a friends of linear plan um, that people would you know, find in, in under settings. They, there would be a new subscription options, and we just said, like, if you subscribe to this plan, I think it was you know, $10, uh, $10 per user uh, per month. Um, we're going to be friends forever, and we're going to appreciate you. Um, and people did. People signed up for that without really getting any benefit out of it. So that gave us the confidence that you know, we're really ready to open it up, um, and we launched publicly, um, and you know, then forced everybody to, uh, to subscribe to a plan. So once you're at that stage, like the MVP has served you well, and you're now sort of in, in, the, in, in the product business trying to sort of you know, find product market fit. Um, you're at the next stage. You're probably ready for funding, um, or you might have been ready for funding even earlier, and you're ready to sort of scale um, your team. So to recap, you know, what you should be thinking about when you're building an MVP, um, the first and most important thing that you should be doing is figuring out what your target audience is and scope it down as much as possible. If you can find sort of a handful of users that you know, probably will want to use your product, that's a good starting point. Um, but make it as small as possible. Um, once you have the target audience, you need to figure out what the functionality is. Keeping in mind your long-term vision, like you want to go somewhere, and you, f you need to figure out like what is a good foundation that you build upon in order to in order to get there, um, and that's the functionality that you build for your target audience, and hopefully that's very little that you have to actually build uh, before you can sort of ship it to them. And the last thing is um, that is often mis you know forgotten when you talk about MVPs is quality, um, like. One of the main points um, that I hope I, I made today is that you're, you're competing um, with somebody because your idea is most likely not novel. So you need to have a competitive product, and usually that means building a real high-quality product as well. Um, if you don't, like, if you're in the space where you don't, um, where you have a novel idea, then you know you don't even know if you, there's a target audience, and then probably quality doesn't really matter. But most of you will will be there. So let's try to redefine um, what MVP stands for. You know, using using what I've said today. So to me, it is sort of the minimum effort um, required to build a competitive uh, product that is viable to a specific selected target audience. So, a few takeaways. Um, narrow down your original audience. Um, the, the biggest takeaway of all, try to figure out who you're building it for and um, make it as small as possible. Secondly, uh, build something competitive for them. Like you're 
competing against other companies in the space unless you're building something novel. Um, so you need to build something great, something that feels good, something of high quality that people will love. Thirdly, um, your wait list is literally that fuel that will get you from your idea to funding or you know, foundational market promise. Um, use it well, build it out, make sure that you have a big one because you will be exchanging that. Um, and the worst case that might happen is that you have a wait list and you run out. Like you've, you're halfway through and then you've got nobody on that wait list. Um, now I have a real problem. I don't know how to solve that. And lastly, um, do not trust your friends when they tell you that you've got a shitty product. Um, thanks. If you want to get Linear three for three months, um, there's a link. Um, the coupon is slash 2023. Use it and um, use it for free. Thanks. <laughs>